As you watch this teaching, I would like to ask you to please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it. This program is made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Welcome to the program. This is Rick Renner. Today we're returning to Christmas, the rest of the story. And you'll see on the screen behind me, Egypt, the pyramids of Giza, and the Holy Family walking along the Nile. You say, what in the world is this? have to do with Christmas. Well, it's a part of the rest of the story that you've never heard before. And that's why I want you to order the whole series called Christmas, the rest of the story, amazing insights about Christmas you've never heard before. It is just thrilling. And I'm telling you that you need it because I really believe you need it. It will really supplement everything you've already heard about the miracle of Christmas, and it will just thrill you. And it comes with a study guide. And right now we're also offering you my book by the same title, Christmas, The Rest of the Story. Look at that cover. Every page of the book looks like this. It is just magnificent. And when you get it, you're going to be so glad you ordered this book and you're going to wish that you had ordered one or two more because it's definitely something you're going to want to share with somebody else. But at the end of the program, my announcer will tell you how you can order all these things. But remember that we want to pray for you. We are praying people. And you know that when you've reached out to us before for prayer, we have really prayed for you. And if you've never reached out to us, I promise you, you will not be disappointed. When you reach out to us by calling us or sending us an email, we will really get into agreement with you for God to move in your life. And I know you need God to move right now. So let us pray with you. But listen to this, and I'll be back in just a moment. Christmas is a timeless tradition. But do you really know the true story of that first holy night? In Rick Renner's timeless new book, Christmas, The Rest of the Story, Rick uncovers the stunning details of the nativity story you have never heard. Like, was Joseph really a carpenter? Who were the shepherds keeping watch? How far did the wise men travel and how many actually came? Through its detailed watercolor illustration, Christmas, The Rest of the Story invites families to explore the true meaning of Christmas as they interact with a story across nearly 300 decorated pages. The Christmas story is the most important story ever told. It is just miraculous. And with this wonderful, fully illustrated book, you will learn so much and you'll want to share it with others. When you call or go online right now to order this book for just $45, you'll receive the eternal story of Christmas, now beautifully told in this timeless keepsake. Found at a landmark, large format book, you will create a family tradition that will last for generations. This sweeping portrait of the Christmas story allows readers to reflect on why Jesus came to earth that holy night and ultimately the reason for his birth. Great as a gift or to enhance your own traditions. Order this beautiful book today, Christmas, the rest of the story for just $45. Call now or go to renner.org to order. Don't miss this special Christmas offer. My friend, today we're going to consider the flight into Egypt, the slaughter of the innocents, and the death of Herod. It's going to really be good, so stay with me all the way to the end. But we're going to begin in Matthew chapter 2, verse 11, which describes what happened when the Magi came to the Holy Family's house in Nazareth. It says, And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. If you missed yesterday's program, please go back to the archives to watch it so you will understand what was the value of all these gifts that the Magi brought to the Holy Family. But notice particularly, it says they brought treasures, which in Greek is plural. It really depicts a storehouse of treasures or cargo filled with treasures. The word gifts is also plural. So here we find there were many, many treasures, many, many gifts. 
And after the Magi lavishly poured out their gifts upon Jesus, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 2, verse 12, And being warned of God in a dream that they, that is the Magi, should not return to Herod, they departed unto their own country another way. And here we see God knows how to speak to every one of us. These were magi and they were professionals at interpreting dreams. And so since their business was dreams, God spoke to them in a dream. God knows how to individualize his message to every single one of us. But when we continue, we find out God was speaking to somebody else in dreams as well. Look at Matthew chapter 2, verse 13. And when they the Magi were departed. Behold, there's that word behold again. It could be translated, wow, isn't it amazing? The angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream saying, arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt and be thou there until I bring thee word for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. But this word flee is really important because the Greek word means to flee or to take flight, to run as fast as possible. It is the very word which could be translated escape. It depicts one's feet flying as he runs from a situation. And the angel said, do it, do it right now. So Joseph arose, took his family, and they moved as fast as they could because the angel said, Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. The words will seek mean, will pursue, will seek, or will earnestly search for. It pictures one so intent on getting his own way that he will search, seek, and investigate, never giving up in his pursuit to get what he wants. And Herod's intention was to destroy him a form of the Greek word apolumi, which means to destroy, to ruin, to devastate, and it pictures total devastation. Herod wanted to destroy the Christ child. So the angel urgently told Joseph, get up, evacuate your family from Nazareth and flee as fast as possible to the land of Egypt. And Joseph's prompt obedience is recorded in Matthew chapter 2, verse 14, and he arose, notice he didn't even question, He just obeyed. God is looking for people that are prompt to obey. And he arose and took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. But Herod, in the meantime, flew into a murderous rampage. We find in Luke chapter 2, verse 16, that when Herod did not hear back from the Magi, he felt mocked by them. And the word mocked means to be outwitted, to be made fun of, to be ridiculed, or to be mocked. And after treating the Magi so royally, he was deeply offended that they didn't come back to him and bring him the information that he wanted. And Matthew 2, 16 says, he was exceedingly wroth. That word wroth describes one that is enraged, absolutely livid, one that cannot control his anger. And it goes on to say that Herod in Matthew 2, 15, sent forth, and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men or of the Magi. The word slew means to take away the life of another, to slay, to kill, or to brutally murder. And you have to remember that he had interrogated the Magi as to when the star first appeared and ascertained that it had appeared about two years earlier. He had also interrogated the scribes and the lawyers, and he had asked them where the Christ should be born. They said that he would be born in Bethlehem. So he's thinking the Christ child is still in Bethlehem. He thinks based on his interrogation of the Magi, the child is about two years old. And now He is sending his troops, his army, his killers to Bethlehem to kill all the babies there that are two years old and under based on what he had learned from the scribes and from the wise men. Interesting that the devil could not identify Jesus. Hmm, Isn't that interesting? The devil is not as smart as we think. And because Herod 
could not identify exactly which baby was the Christ child who he thought was in Bethlehem. He just said, kill all of them that are two years old and under, and then we'll be sure that in the middle of all of them, we've killed him as well. He just did not understand that Jesus and his parents had already been gone for two years. They had been safely living in Nazareth. But this is called the slaughter of the innocents. And Matthew is the only gospel writer to record it. And strangely, this event was not even recorded by Josephus, the great Jewish historian who recorded the, the very brutal acts of Herod. But here's the reason why. Herod did a lot of brutal things, but the numbers of babies that he killed in Bethlehem didn't rate to make it in the great chronology of all of his brutal acts. Now, the killing of one baby is terrible, but he killed very few babies. Most people think that he killed thousands of babies, and I'm going to cover that right now. Herod thought the Christ child was in Bethlehem. He did not know that Jesus was already in Nazareth, so he just gave the order, kill them all. If we kill them all, somewhere in the middle of all of them, we'll get the one. But most people believe that maybe Herod killed about 14,000 boys. One record says possibly he killed 64,000 boys. And of course, this would truly be an atrocity. But there's a big problem with these numbers because Bethlehem, at its largest estimate, had no more than 480 people. So it wasn't possible for Herod to have slaughtered 14,000 or 64,000 babies. That's all based on paintings which were painted in the Middle Ages, not on historical fact. And on the basis of the population of Bethlehem at that time, scholars estimate the real number of baby boys he slaughtered was probably fewer than 20. Some bring the figure down to 15, others say 10 or 12, and some speculate it was about six boys that were killed at that time. And again, the killing of any child is horrific. But the point is, the number that were slaughtered in Bethlehem was much smaller than most people have imagined. But Herod would have eventually figured out that he missed the Christ child and that the Christ child was living in Nazareth. And to help the Holy Family escape Herod's brutal attack, the angel showed up and said, get up, get out as fast as you can, get to the land of Egypt. This reminds us that if we'll listen to the Lord, He'll tell us what to do to be protected. And if we will obey him, we will live in his protection. But let me ask you a question. How expensive was Egypt? Well, Egypt was one of the most luxurious nations on the earth at that time. And as a foreigner, Joseph would have had no legal right to work there. Plus, the Holy Family was in flight the entire time they were there for about three years, so he never would have had an opportunity to get a job. And because Egypt was so expensive, a foreigner living there and constantly being on the move, it would have been very, very expensive. Plus, they weren't living in one single location. They were packing up and moving and using all kinds of transport. My friends, this was going to be a very expensive endeavor. And God knew all of this in advance. And he supernaturally orchestrated, orchestrated the arrival of the Magi with all their money and all their gifts just in time to deliver the financial resources needed to meet his son's need while the Holy Family was in flight in Egypt. The timing of God is just amazing. I like to say that the Holy Family experienced Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, which says in the King James Version, But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. The word supply means to make full, to fill completely, or to be filled to the point of satisfaction. It was the very word used to describe any kind of container filled and packed to the point of overflowing. The word needs in this verse depicts any deficit or any need that must be met. The word riches is a Greek word which describes wealth so great it cannot be tabulated. And here is the RIV 
of Philippians 4.19. Listen to this. But my God will supply your needs so completely that he will eliminate all your deficiencies. He will meet all your physical and tangible needs until you're so full you have no more capacity to hold anything else. He will supply all your needs until you're totally filled, packed full and overflowing to the point of bursting at the seams and spilling over. And that's what happened with the Holy Family. They experienced Philippians chapter 4, 19. Now, we don't know how much money Joseph and the Holy Family took with them into Egypt, but the question often arises, so what happened to the rest of the money? If the Magi brought treasures and treasures and treasures and treasures, they couldn't have carried all of it with them into Egypt. So what happened to the rest of the money? And that's a very good question. And you have to understand that when Joseph and Mary and Jesus were in Egypt, they were there approximately three years. They traveled more than 1,200 miles on foot by animal, by ship that carried them up the Nile. And it was going to take a lot of money, but they couldn't carry all those funds into Egypt. But nearby to Nazareth was the big, beautiful city of Sephora, which was the banking center of the Middle East. And it is likely that all the funds and all the treasures were deposited there. And later in life, after Joseph died, Jesus became the inheritor of all of those resources. And that may explain where there's no record anywhere in the Gospels that Jesus ever took up an offering for his ministry. God fully funded his son's life and his son's ministry from the very, very beginning. But how did the Holy Family get to Egypt? And there were two ways for them to get to Egypt from Nazareth. Two ways. The first and the easiest route was on a well-known highway, which was called the Via Maris, which means the highway of the sea. It traversed from Damascus along the Sea of Galilee. It meandered through Israel, around the Mediterranean Sea, and finally it came to Egypt. But most scholars believe that the Holy Family took the alternative route through the desert, which was barren and very, very difficult, and took about 14 days to reach Egypt. And the reason they believe that the Holy Family took that alternative route is because it would have been more difficult for Herod's spies to find them there. But eventually they reached the land of Egypt. And the oldest records from the Egyptian Coptic Church suggest the Holy Family indeed fled by the desert route, which took about 14 days, but finally they got there. But once Herod realized Christ had escaped, he dispatched spies into the land of Egypt to look for the Christ. And that is why the Holy Family was in movement the entire time they were there. And that is why it is traditionally called the flight through Egypt. They were literally on the move all the time. And the Egyptian Coptic Church is very proud of the fact that the Holy Family lived in Egypt for a period of time. And from the earliest ages, they documented all the places where the Holy Family stopped while they were in flight. And my son, Joel, and I have been to many of those locations. You can really still visit those places today if you have the time and the resources to do so. It's kind of difficult, but you really can get to all of those places. But they were very proud of the fact that the Holy Family was in Egypt. So scholars in the earliest years of the Egyptian Coptic Church documented all those places. And I'm going to give you a condensed list of about 30 places where the Holy Family was during the three years that they were in Egypt. I'm going to read it to you. And please be patient with me as I read these Egyptian names. Upon first arriving in Egypt, the Holy Family came to the Nile Delta, where they briefly stayed at a village about 72 miles northeast of Old Cairo. From there, they fled south to Mustorad, about seven miles from Old Cairo. From there, they fled temporarily to Belbis. From there, they fled onward to Miniat Samarnud, where records show that the local population showed them hospitality for the time they were there. And from there, they fled to the ancient city of Berulus. From there, they fled across the Rosetta branch of the Nile River to Wadi El Natrun, which is located in the western desert of Egypt. When Egyptian Christianity later began to flourish, monasteries were built in this region as a tribute to the Holy Family's short-term stay there. But from there, they fled south 
across the eastern bank of the Nile River to the cities of Matareya and Ein's Sham. From there, they fled to the famous Egyptian city of Heliopolis. And from Heliopolis, they fled to Old Cairo, where they would have seen the Sphinx, the Pyramids of Giza, and other Egyptian monuments. From there, they fled again to Maudi, which was a city that in Pharaonic times was a district of Memphis, which was the capital of Egypt. And while in Maudi, the Coptic church documents show that Joseph befriended sailors who worked on boats and ships that floated on the Nile River. And due to his friendship with them soon, the Holy Family fled by a ship south by the River Nile to Deir el Ganus. And then to Ashmin el Nasara. And from there they fled by the Nile River to El Basanara. And though we don't know how long they stayed there, El Bas Nasa was so associated with the Holy Family that it later was called the Egyptian hometown of Jesus. And from there they fled to Sam al Ut. And from there they fled across the Nile River to the eastern bank where Coptic documents say they briefly stayed at Gabal al Tair. From there they fled a path along the Nile River to Naz el Ebate. And from there they fled south back across the western bank of the Nile River to dwell temporarily in El Ash Munain. And from there they fled to Dairut al Sharif also named by the Greek name Phileas, and from there they fled to Kuskam, and from there they fled approximately seven miles to Mier, where they found a hospitable community who welcomed them, and from there they fled again to Gabal, Kuskam, an ancient city where an altar had been built to the Lord in the land of Egypt, and it seems the Holy Family lived there for approximately six months. But then in Matthew 2, 20, the Bible says, that the angel spoke to Joseph and said, Arise and take the young child and his mother and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. Scholars generally agree the entire flight throughout the land of Egypt lasted approximately three years, and the Holy Family traveled more than 1,200 miles by foot, by animal, and by ship along the waters of the Nile. It was a massive financial undertaking, but God supplied everything they needed for it just on time, just like he'll do for you. But then we come to Matthew chapter 2, verses 19 to 20, which says, But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. And Matthew 2, 21 says, And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. Verse 22. And when he, Joseph, heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go thither. Notwithstanding, being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into parts of Galilee. Verse 23. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Notice every word of prophetic scripture was fulfilled concerning Jesus. But God marvelously provided everything they needed for everything he ever asked them to do. And that's what God will do for you too. Philippians 419 is yours to claim. I'll be back in just a moment and I want to pray for you. Do you really know the story of Christmas? Is there more to the story about the birth of our Savior than what you've been told? In this series, Christmas, The Rest of the Story, Rick Renner dives deep into the parts of the Christmas story that most people have never heard. Rick says, I've studied this story for decades, and I found fabulous treasures no one ever shared with me. In this series, we explore the Bible, history, historical writings, and so much more, so we can really understand all the events that took place surrounding the birth of Jesus. Rick answers questions like, why did God choose Mary? Was Joseph really a carpenter? Why was Herod so troubled by Jesus' birth? Who were the Magi? And what was the estimated value of their gifts? This 15-part documentary-type series is available in digital or physical format, starting at just $24. And we're excited to also offer you Rick's stunning new book, Christmas, The Rest of the Story. 
It's a book you'll want to share with friends and family at this time of the year. This hardcover, 300-page, fully illustrated book is a keepsake that friends and family will pass on to future generations. Don't miss this special offer, the series, Christmas, The Rest of the Story, and the beautiful book, Christmas, The Rest of the Story. Call the number on your screen now or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. Hey friends, this is Rick Renner and I'm standing outside the new TV studio in Moscow. Praise God, most of the interior is already finished. They're still working on Denise's studio, so pray for us as we continue, it's gonna be nice. And if you see the big bulldozer behind me, that's because they're getting ready to do the parking lot. You know, winter comes pretty early in our part of the world, so we need to really seize the moment and get this parking done before the cold weather sets in. But hey, we're making progress and praise God, the studio is paid for. This is all paid for. And I wanna say thank you for being the most amazing partners and helping us with this. And now the project in front of us is to pay off the Tulsa facility. We want to retire the debt on the big office complex in Tulsa because when that's paid off, suddenly all those finances are gonna be released for us to go on more TV and minister to people all over the world. My friends, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 10, 21, that the lips of the righteous feed many. I know that's my assignment, to feed as many people the Word of God as possible, and I'm doing it with you. Wow, thank you for being a partner. You're part of the giving team that's helping us make amazing progress. And if you're not a part of the giving team yet, please pray about joining us to retire the debt on the Tulsa building. It's not about buildings. It's just about having the space we need so that we can effectively minister to people. We want to retire that debt so we can take the Word of God to more parts of the world where people are crying out for teaching they can trust. And I want to say thank you for everything you do. Hey, have you learned something new today? We've been talking about the Holy Family's flight through Egypt. It is amazing to me what the early church fathers wrote that agrees with the writings of the New Testament. There is so much to this story that I'm sure you've never heard before. And that's why I want you to have the entire new series, which is called Christmas, the rest of the story. The subtitle says Amazing Insights. Would you agree? This series is filled with some amazing insights about Christmas you've never heard before. That's why I really want you to have this. Please order it by going online or by giving us a call and it comes with a study guide. And today and tomorrow is the last day which we're offering my book by the same title, Christmas, the rest of the story. Don't miss this opportunity to get yours now. Just give us a call or go online. But I want to pray for you. Put your hand on your heart. Father, I thank you that Philippians 4.19 belongs to us just like it belonged to the Holy Family and just like you met their needs according to your riches and glory. You want to meet our needs too. We reach out by faith to take hold of your supernatural provision. I speak it to me. I speak it to my friend. In the precious name of Jesus, amen, amen. Well, tomorrow we're going to conclude with the real purpose of Christmas. Don't miss it. But hey, I want you to remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, which says, where the word of a king is, there is power. This program was made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. If that teaching helped you, would you please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it.